Hey, thanks for coming back to the SBP podcast, Mobile Filmmaking. I'm your host, Susie Botello, and you're listening to episode 128. So a few things happened over the last few months, and we've been really busy. Now, the first thing that happened, obviously, was that we held our film festival in San Diego in person. That was amazing, incredible, lots of fun. I was caught off guard by the number of people, filmmakers especially, that showed up in person. Uh, they flew from different parts of the world to, to be here. And we also had a good number of filmmakers that came out from L.A. You know where L.A. is, right? So we're Beverly Hills, Hollywood. We're, we're just a hop and a skip away. So it was really great to um, have the filmmakers that, um, and to be honest, well, I hate saying that. Um, I've been dishonest this whole time. But basically, we had some of these filmmakers who came from different previous years that we had to shut down the in-person film festival, like Levi Austin Morris. Uh, who submitted a film back in 2020, The Tea. And we also had Jennifer Zhang, who was a VIP judge for the feature film competition for this year. But she won Best Film with her film Sharon in 2021. And we had a number of other filmmakers and people who came out um, sorry, I can't name you all because, uh, well, you know, it, it's just a tough thing to do. But we do have our international mobilefilmfestival.com website. And if you go there to um, dip to the news page, you'll find out about them as well. Some other interesting things that have been going on is that um, I did some research on distribution for smartphone films and I'd like to bring the news to you um, here's really cool news actually very quietly behind the scenes something really cool has been happening apparently now we knew about this a couple of years ago you could find one maybe two films that were shot with smartphones and I'm talking about feature length films they were in Amazon Prime or Tubi or some of those places. But I found more of uh, the filmmakers that I've been speaking to, especially from this year's film festival, that were getting distribution. Now, if you remember in 2021, Jennifer Zhang's film, Sharon, uh, made it around the world. It kind of went viral and uh, Deadline uh, covered it a big publication and then uh, Apple covered it in their publication and a lot of you know different uh, media organizations began to catch on to it and uh, the film was um, in the film market at Cannes and I was really impressed by all the attention this film was getting and Jennifer is a is an awesome person she's incredibly in intelligent as well and we'll have to get her back on this podcast but right now she is <laughs> seriously on a run for her other films because she doesn't just shoot with smartphones she's a producer and uh, she you know is also a writer and an actor and uh, you know just you know she's she's quite something so she's uh, she's quite busy however um, I just wanted to point that out because it was the first film that I saw that was really getting some national and international attention uh, being shot with a phone. But then, lo and behold, uh, surveilled with Caroline and James Smith, who attended the film festival with uh, a few of the actors from that film that also came out. Um, that film is... I mean, it, it, it just, it's on Tubi, it's on Amazon Prime, it's, it's everywhere. And this was their fifth, I believe, 
if I'm getting my facts right here, uh, but it was their fifth feature film, and their previous films have also um, been, well, they've been getting more attention, and that's kind of what happens when you have a good film that picks up, and people start to know, who are these guys, right? And then they look you up, and they see your other films, and guess what? You know, Agent Kelly um, was shot with a DSLR, awesome cinematography by James Smith, and that film also just started going wild and a little bit viral uh, on the distribution of that one. And that one is also available, I believe, on Tubi and some of the other distribution channels. And was now recently, now this was years ago that they shot this film in Spain, in Andalusia. But this film was also is also now receiving a lot of attention and they are... Uh, Jen- uh, Jennifer, I'm sorry, Jennifer, um, Caroline and James are getting uh, their boots on now as they um, have already uh, been in production for their latest film and they're gearing up to another one. And man, those guys are a power couple. They just they just don't know where to stop. Anyways, uh, it's very impressive and the other thing that happened uh, over the summer in July was, ta-da, Comic-Con, San Diego. I was super happy to be there. I was more of a an attendee spectator and was able to attend our friend and sponsor's uh, panel. Now, listen, uh, Keith and Jones is a name to remember. He is a comic book artist but and a writer, and he's just an overall awesome guy. And we've known him for several years. He's attended our film festival, show support. Um, I've been attending uh, an event that he holds here for, um, it's called Black Comics Day, and it's wonderful and so this last year he began to sponsor our film festival so it was a great honor to include him in the sponsored um, featured people (laughs) that we have for a film festival so I want to give a big shout out to him he was uh, one of the spotlight artists at comic-con that's a big deal it's a really big deal, and uh, he hopes to take everything worldwide. So watch out for him in your neighborhood if you happen to be uh, in other states in in our country and in other countries uh, around the world. Um, okay, we have a very special guest again. Uh, we are continuing our In the Weeds series with... Jason C. Marshall. Hey, Jason, how you doing? Peace. I am good, Susie. It's uh, been a while since we uh, since we talked. Yeah. How have you been? Uh, it's how it's been quite a long while, actually. How's your summer? going uh hot and cold <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's it's a weird summer yeah. up here we get we get you know a week of cool weather and then then this weekend it's boiling lava hot <laughs> yeah it's been like that it's august september weather here is always a little muggy too um yeah, now here got, here is this in san diego but you're in ottawa in canada yep nation's capital um, I actually have, and my I have model making friends, one in Texas and one in Florida, and they're, Ooh. you know, and they we often you know talk about the weather, and they you know, they're like, you don't get humidity like we do down here. I'm like, you want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I lived in Georgia once, and we arrived in the middle of the night, um, and <laughs> we uh, my I, I I opened the front door to go to the pool the next day. And I hit a mm-hmm. wall of no oxygen because it was oh, so Jesus. humid hot. Ugh. Yeah, it was horrible. But I'm sure people aren't listening to hear about the weather. Um, hey, Jason, why don't you bring us up to speed? Because we are 
literally in the weeds yes you know, about yes, storytelling screenwriting um all that story structure uh what are we going to talk about today uh, we're going to do a little bit of review on things we talked about and a few things I've, I've kind of uh, picked up on uh, over the... So let me tell you a little story. So since we had our last podcast, I've been doing a number of... A, a number of... A few script doctorings um, here. And I've... Uh, okay, let me back up even further. In 2018, I started learning about story structure because I wanted to figure out why my films were garbage. And you realize I can't, can't do a story, so I learned structure. And like, okay, well, that's only one part of it. That's not enough. What's next? Character arc. Then you learn the character arc and structure work together to form plot, which gives you a compelling story. These three elements work together. But I've been trying to find a way to simplify it and make it, you know, a much... How can I package this in a way that's super, super easy to understand? And the most recent scripts, I, did, I just did two back-to-back one for a friend of a friend and one for a direct friend. And looking at them, and it, it was like, it was like repeat, like it was like doing one and then the next one was like the exact same thing. The, 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 the defects were the same. I'm like, okay, here's what we need to do. We need, there's three questions you need to answer. You absolutely have to answer either when you're breaking your script or after you've written a first draft, because some people write a vomit draft and then, and then they go back and revise. Whatever works for, for the individual. Did you just call yeah. it a vomit? Vomit draft? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I just wanted to make exactly. sure. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, where, where you just let it all out. You just, just, right. just vomit it on, just on the page. One big dump. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, but, but dump draft doesn't sound quite as good. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's three questions you have to answer. And this is, I'm going to make a slight modification from the last time we talked about character. When we talked about character last time. said your character needs to have something they want and something they need. Oftentimes they end up being the same thing at the, at the end of the story. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes they get the thing they want and realize that it's not what they wanted, and they have to find... And they, then through the course of the story, they get the thing that they need to be a more complete person or learn a lesson or, or whatever. So want and need still applies, but sometimes it doesn't fit. And I was thinking about this, and the idea of a, of a character flaw came up. Hmm. So when you're, when, you're, when you're looking at your character and the story you want to tell a, a, that, you know, about them or the journey they go on, they either need to have a want and a need, or if that doesn't fit, a flaw to overcome. I love that. Okay. Um, and in conjunction with that, they need to have a false belief about the world around them. I call you know, a, a false belief, an untruth, whatever you want to call it. Something they believe about themselves in the world that isn't true, but that guides all their decision making. So let's let's uh, let's put that in one neat little package, you know, as a visual for everyone right now. Go for it and just kind of like use a raw example. Uh, raw example. Okay, um, I'm gonna pull this off the Guy top of my head. Guy walks into a bar, you know that kind of a thing. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll actually use a I'll actually use a movie. Okay, Wonder Woman. She wants to stop Ares because she believes that Ares corrupts man. Okay, so she sees the world in black and white. So that is her want is to stop that from happening. Her need is to understand that the world is shades of gray and. People are both good and bad simultaneously. That that's her journey. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can uh, you, you could look at that as a, once again, but you can equate that to flaw to overcome. Yeah. They're kind of one. They're kind of one and the same. It, it's 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 such a subtle line between the two, but depending on the story you're trying to to break or develop or fix, it 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 it's actually a massive difference. Yeah, and I think by emphasizing, you know, do you want... Now, if I put both my hands, I just want to give you guys the visual 
they're together touching fingers, right? I'll spread them apart a little bit. They're mm-hmm. both at the same level. And so you could kind of say, well, yes, it's it's a flaw, but it's also part of her journey. But, mm-hmm. you know, part of her journey is connected to this flaw. Or you can raise the journey to basically um, give that journey. You'll know that it she has flaws, and that's part of the journey as she's learning and overcoming these mm-hmm. flaws. Or you could do the opposite and say raise the flaw there's a very evident flaw, and now she's having this journey, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And which one you emphasize more is part of where the plot really thickens, right, in your story. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I just think it would, you know, kind of a, and I'll kind of talk about flaw a little bit. Um, there's a movie that didn't do too well back in around 99, 2000 called For Love of the Game with Kevin Costner and Kelly Preston. In that movie, he's a he's a pitcher who's at the end of his career, and during what turns out to be his last game, through the course of the innings, he flashes back to his relationship and them not being able to get it together. But he has a flaw; he thinks he has to do it all on his own. Okay, mm-hmm. his and you see it through the course of the movie that even as he's getting tired, even as his shoulder is getting sore. He's still trying to throw a perfect game and strike everyone out. But eventually that can't happen, and he has to rely on his team to pick up the slack. Through the course of the movie and his journey, he overcomes this, this flaw he's had that he, you have to depend on others. You can't do it by, all by yourself. Got it. If that, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah. And... Um, so, yeah, so you got those two things, and the third thing you need, the third thing you absolutely need, need is your theme. The question you're trying to answer or the message you're trying to get across, whatever whatever it may be. And coming back to For Love of the Game, in the opening, Kelly Preston says to him, you never needed me, it was just you, you and the mound and the ball, and that's all you've ever needed. She, she not only says what the theme is, she also says what his flaw is to him, but he's not ready to listen to it, and that's the whole point of the character's journey through through your movie, be it a feature or a short. It all applies. I see. So, you you absolutely need to answer those three questions, ideally before you start. But if not, because I've been doing doctoring on first drafts, and I've actually sat down with the writers of both of them, and been okay... Because they send me the script, I do my thing, and then I put everything down, and then I sit them down and say, here's, here's all the things I did, here's why the things that why I did what I did. But I interview them beforehand, I'm like, oh, to get the answers to these questions that they, they may have answered subconsciously, but not consciously during the writing process. So I need to suss that out. Mm. What, what's, what's their flaw? What do they want? What do they need? What's the theme? What... Because what you also need a cause and effect. And if exactly. you just give people the effect but don't show them the cause, no matter how you do it, you have to do it consciously or they won't they won't really get the effect. Well, exactly. Cause, and this leads into the next part, which is the actually stru- restructuring the film. Because both script... The, once again, I'm, I'm focusing on the two I've done recently. Like, I did one last week and one just yesterday. Right. Um, so they're very recent. And um, I can't structure it because, as written, there's no structure. And I need those questions answered so I can apply structure to what they've written. Because the goal isn't to blow it all up and start again. The goal is to keep as much as they've already written as possible and backfill it. Yeah. So, and here, here is... This is my diagnosis of amateur scriptwriters. They have an idea, and they write it down, and they think it's great, but an idea is not a story. And when you, when you start analyzing it, when you, when you understand structure, which you and I will be getting to in the coming podcasts... Um, you need a crescendo. Yeah. 
Well, cause, so yeah, so what's happening is there's no, I call it disruption, other people call it catalyst, other people call it inciting incident, whatnot. There's nothing to propel them on their journey. So we, an- so you know, I talked to talk to Liam, and I talked to Matt, I'm like, so we answered these three questions. But you don't have an event, a thing that takes them from their normal world. You just because you need to set up who they are and the world they exist in mm-hmm. before before blowing it all up. They don't have that blow up thing that 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 key element that propels everything forward. And this is the thing I'm seeing in virtually every script I've done. They either start at the disruption with no setup, so you don't care about the characters. Or there's no, there's no disruption at all, and you don't care what the characters. You know, in a lot of in a lot of films, you know, like I've said, and we've talked about this before, that the beginning, the middle, and the end don't always have to follow. You know, one, two, three could be three, mm-hmm. two, one could be you know all those things, and I think you know there there's the message of you got to grab your audience's attention and sometimes Mm -hmm. you do that by bringing them into either the middle or close to the end right or Mm -hmm. at the end and then go back and explain that and so it's not that easy as it seems to do that you know if you're thinking of it just as a viewer Mm -hmm. as you would as a writer or somebody that's creating that effect because mm-hmm. what happens is you're going it's a it's a plane crashing like uh what was it the the one in uh tom hanks in that movie uh, castaway yes that was the most incredible plane crash you mm-hmm. know um but anyways but but you don't I mean, does it, does it open with the plane crash no no what i'm getting yeah i'm yeah. getting to my point so yeah. Some people would say if you start with the plane crash, right, and then go back and tell the story of how, why this, you know, how, where this is coming from, you've got your audience's attention with the plane crash. The problem is that you can't just start stories like that and expect them to captivate because what comes after that plane crash, you really need to now hook Mm -hmm. them and a plane crash and no matter how cool it sounds to you for the viewer after that Mm. two minute plane crash or 30 second plane crash or whatever it better be damn good now Mm -hmm. in order to get them i was actually gonna say so as far as you diagnosing things that are the consistencies i've seen in 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 script writing um it's actually a weak opening. Yeah. Because you look at the prologue needs to do a number of things. One is show where we are, when we are, you know, set the tone of the movie, maybe introduce your main character, maybe not. They don't have to be in the in the in the very first scene. But it also has to be engaging enough to hook the viewer because if it doesn't, then you've then they're not going to, once again, care about anything that follows. So, you know, don't open up with a boring, oh, they open their eyes and they walk to the bathroom and then they brush their teeth. And like, you know, <laughs> there's, there's a, okay, there's a video game called, I think it's called Hard Rain. I'm not sure my wife plays it or played it. And I'm like, there's literally, uh, there's literally a part where you use the controller to, br- to brush the character's teeth. Like, you know, press press A really <laughs> fast or whatnot. I'm, I'm not a gamer, so yeah. I, I can't. So, um, But I've watched it. Or like they do, you know, in GTA Five, they add a whole yoga thing. I'm like, that's really boring. And that's a really, <laughs> that's a really crappy way to extend gameplay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the point is that, so as well as, you know, so you need to, you need to have a strong opening to engage people. It doesn't have to be like explosions or plane crashes, just something engaging and you need a disruption that sends them on their journey. You're, you're literally you, at, stringing people along, though. And yeah, you and I have yeah, spoken yeah. about this before and how many, how many ways, all the thousand ways that you can do that visually, also with audio, also with even zooming in or zooming out 
of a mm-hmm. shot, of a detail, you know, all those things, slow motion, you know, all these ways that you can do it. But the one thing that you don't want to do is extend that grabbing, you know, grabbing the attention mm-hmm. of someone and extend it just a bit too long. Yeah. Because then yeah, exactly. it gets boring, even if it is a plane crash. Mm-hmm. There's no reasoning behind it. There's some you have to fulfill. Mm-hmm. This is why filmmaking is an art, but also mm-hmm. a science, because psychologically you have to know how those things work, which is why we talked before about bringing other people in to help you, uh, under, you know, with the mm-hmm. filmmaking. Well, yeah, exactly. Um, and speaking of bringing other people in, um, for the, the script I did two weeks ago, actually, I did a first pa- I talked to talked to the writer, Liam, got some information, and and plotted all out on my whiteboard, but I wasn't happy with it. So I actually called Julian in to come in and, and help me with the second pass. Hey, because, Julian! Because <laughs> <laughs> he's because he's he's not quite as up to speed as I am, but I don't have to explain every every story element to him, so we can we can just work it out. Uh, which is which is really helpful. Whereas with with the you know, with with Liam and Matt, I had to explain like this goes here for these reasons, and it, it's, it kind of slows down the process. Whereas having someone who understands it, you can come in and you can just start start working it out. And um, uh, speaking of, when I talked to Liam, we we're deciding what what does the character want, and what does he need, and the topic of money came up, and I did a whole breakdown of the script based around that but it was muddy and it wasn't interesting and I got thinking about that and I'm like okay money's not enough it's not enough of a it's not enough of a thing because everyone needs money what well like wh- what money does he specifically need why does he need specific money etc cetera, etc cetera. so when I brought Julian in I'm like okay here's the problem I'm having all this is a mess <laughs> so we so we went back and talked about the script because it's, it, Liam's a friend of his um, and he actually, Liam produced a web, um, sorry, an original streaming series, a little one on YouTube, uh, called Plowboys, um, which people should check out. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, we were talking it out, and we looked back at the script, and then this is where having a sounding board really pays off, because I talked to him, and I'm like, here's everything in the script. And as we were bouncing ideas, I'm like, wait, 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 wait. This is a passive character. He lets things happen to him. He's not active in his own life. So we're like, okay. Now we have the... So we switch from want and need to flaw to overcome. He's a passive character who needs to learn to be active in their own life and have basically have agency over their own life. And once we figured that out, remapping it was infinitely easier. I get it. Now, now we actually did. We actually did keep the money aspect of it, though. But we we shifted it up. Now, this is an element that Liam may not keep. It was just the first idea that kind of came to mind. That he okay, he needs money because now I realize things are different here in Canada than the U.S. But he's like he's got a relative. He's got a relative or a family member who needs who needs treatment that's not covered by an insurance plan or. Or in the case of like on like if it takes place in Ontario, it's not covered by our our provincial health plan. So it that what that does that serves as the catalyst to move the story forward. But the purpose of the story is to make the character not a passive person anymore. The needing money immediately and to do do the shady thing we send them off on is only the thing that moves the story forward. It's the incident, the inciting incident that moves the story forward. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I, I hope I explained that clearly. If not, just ask for any clarification. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, again, uh, for, for listeners, let's do kind of a little bit of what we did earlier and package mm-hmm. it a little bit, um, you know, in, in one paragraph, sort of. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, how do I want to say that? Okay. Jeez, uh, let me think of this because we just I, I try, I've, I've I've actually forgotten how we got down this path. What 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 element we were talking well, we about? We were talking. <laughs> yeah, we were talking basically about 
you know, the beginning, right? Yeah. And how yes. the psychology of stringing people along and, and bringing them along in the journey. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm all about setup. Um, the, 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 the first, the first 15, 20%, like even, even before going in, you know, even before the end of act one, like even, like even up to the disruption catalyst inciting incident, whatever you want to call it, how important that is because you need to set up in quick succession who the character is, what their flaws, what they want, what they need, what they believe to be fault, you know, their belief that about the world that's false. Have a characteristic moment or a save the cat moment, whatever you want to call it, where we show that the person is a good person. You know, they like John Candy in in Armed and Dangerous. He literally saves a cat from a tree, but then he gets stuck in a tree because he's afraid of heights. <laughs> oh, I love that. It's it, it, it's it's there's there's Look, at screenwriting is hard. There's a million things you have to remember and do in order every time. And it's a lot to keep track of. So, I mean, it's, 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 no, it's not a fault to not know it all. Um, but you got to keep educating yourself and trial and error over and over and again. The point is, though, set up who they are, what they want, what they need, what their flaw is, what the theme is, and... and uh, and untruth they believe about the world, you need to get all that knocked out before you have the catalyst that moves the story forward. You know, the hardest part going into the screen part, the screenwriting part, by the way, we should, we should let our listeners know that we do have a screenplay contest and it's not this hard (laughs) because it's for (laughs) short films. It's like four to eight pages. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you guys are interested, internationalmobilefilmfestival.com. I, this is not an ad, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I do want to mention that because this is important. When we're talking about screenwriting, you do have to have notes. Yes. And a lot of the screenwriting software will help you with that. Like the first thing you do is you set up your characters. You describe them a little bit you know, and a little bit about the part that they play as a whole before yeah, you she, even start. Yeah, she, you need to, need to know who you're following and why. what's their journey, why should you care. So, yeah, you kind of need to have that. That's a very important piece. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think it's missed a lot because when we start writing, you know, like I'd love to write free flow, right Mm -hmm. whether it's a story or whatever it is because for me everything is a story right so Mm -hmm. you know i naturally do that but the one thing that i found the hardest to do is to start before starting right and and that's that's the crucial part is who are your characters what are their names even if you change them later their ages you know and you know their relationship to the protagonist and to the story itself all those little mm-hmm. things really humanize them. Yeah. You know, and like you were talking before about the flaws, you know, John Candy's character, you know, all right, so he's afraid of heights. Mm-hmm. You know, so that when you're writing, even if it's your first draft from the idea, as you're free flowing and just you're in the zone and you you're you're getting this done, you have, you know, John Candy comes up. John Candy, I hope you're listening up there. (laughs) Uh, But he comes up and automatically this card, you know, is viewable for you to see who John Candy Mm -hmm. is. And now you can emphasize some of these elements so you can at least start to introduce them to your audience. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Elaborate that, on that because you know this better than I do. Yeah. Well, I, I, you got me thinking. Uh, there's one. Once you know, I said there's a million elements to remember. Also, in your first your first act, you need to everything that comes later. You need to set up, um, like, and it, it could be little things. It could be big things. Um, I was watching the original RoboCop uh, today. Oh wow! And because it's an excellent movie, and uh, it. It still holds pretty true. Um, some of the messaging in there and the thematic elements in there are pretty pretty strong still today. But when when Peter Weller 
uh, goes to arrest one of the baddies before he before he gets killed. Um, he's like, dead or alive, you're coming with me. Then, then, then the rest of the gang show up and they kill him and he gets turned into Robocop. Yep. Then, and then, um, you know, partway through the second act, he comes across that guy again, at, but, you know, he's a cyborg now and you can't see his face, but he's like, you know, dead or alive, you're coming with me. And it was important to say that line early so that the bad guy would recognize that the cyborg is the guy that he thought they killed. Because he's like, we, he's like, you're dead. We killed you. Yeah. It's a like it, it's it's a bit of a. Uh, That's a great example, though. It, it is. It's it's not a subtle one. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it in you know to to do other other setups and. They do that in, in the in Matrix. A way. In the Matrix, yeah. they do some really subtle things. Which is what starts conversations even within yourself. Well, exactly. Now, here's the thing, though. This is, even doing this, it's, it's a delicate art because you can either... you got to ride the line because you can do it super heavy-handed and it's super obvious, or you can do it so subtly people don't even catch it. Yeah. You, it's, it's such a delicate line to ride. And there's a, like I said, there's just so many elements and you just... You just try to you write it and try it and trial and error until you until you kind of find what what works for you as a as a writer. But yeah, the first they said the first act, even the even the first half of the first act, is so so important. It is because if you don't put all these things in place, then it doesn't then 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 you then you run into problems down the road. Now I do want to emphasize to our listeners that. That doesn't mean we're saying get stuck on that first half of the first act or the first act and, you know, really freak out if you don't have that, (laughs) you know, all done before you move on. Go for it. Move on. Then go back to it. And that's when you rewrite all those little things and 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 having the sounding board. Well, exactly. Because, yeah, it's it's nothing's permanent. Right, because you can you you can set something up and find out later it doesn't work, and that's fine. You just go back and change it and and alter. Like it's not. It's impossible to write yourself into a corner because if, if you just take a breath and do a quick analysis of everything you've done up to that point, you can fix anything. And that's part of it. That's why there's you know, the first draft, right? Yep. Oh, and and speaking of. Um, I do have a. It's been. I haven't been posting to my, to my screenwriting Instagram uh, as frequently as my model making one, uh, lately. But there is there is photos of my whiteboard and works in progress on, on my Jason C Marshall uh, Instagram. If anyone decides they want to check that out, is that is that want, the uh, the username? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, username at Jason C Marshall on Instagram. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Right now, there's kind of a lot of never stuff up there, but scroll down a little bit, and uh, I've got several whiteboard photos. So you, so you can actually see my process, and there's a caption to go with them all. And don't get scared and freaked out when you see those. <laughs> because, <laughs> I mean, the, look, it, it's, 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 it can be overwhelming. And again, I think, so what I'm trying to do with with you guys who are listening is to really emphasize how important it is for you to start screenwriting even if you're just doing a short film uh and and obviously we're talking about narratives but the the point of it is that you get start to really get used to this because you catch things before you shoot things that's the first thing and there i mean look this is a a niche industry mobile filmmaking right making movies with Mm -hmm. your smartphone and everything but there are thousands of people that are doing it you're not one in ten anymore and people are not watching mobile films just because they're shot with a mobile film you still want to have that value you know in in our film festival we have this rookie category right but we Mm -hmm. have a higher expectation of mobile filmmakers than we did before you know, yeah. I mean, this is we're going on our twelfth well, yeah, yeah, year. It's, yeah, it's it's a, it's a mature medium now. Yeah, and there's more people involved, and there are also a lot of indie filmmakers 
that are involved. And indie filmmakers have been making films before, you know, and it's not just this is their first film. Now, for some of you who've never made a film before, this is part of the value of the message that we're sending to you. It's actually this. Mm -hmm. You want to have a great story because you are competing with other people who are more experienced than you and who are less experienced than you, but they somehow are able to grasp this, you know, and we want you to do it too. And it's part of well, why exactly. we're doing this in the weed series with Jason. Well, yeah, like it, it, it took me, it took me four years. Uh, now this no, obviously not full time because, right. you know, I'm, I'm not a full time filmmaker, but it took me four years off and on to, to get to the point where I can, I can watch anything now and, and, and see it, see the pieces without having to really think about it. And now I can train you know, now through conversations with you, I can spread that information in a much more a digestible fashion, easier to follow so that others don't have to spend nearly as much time figuring it out as I had to. And I'm really can, picking your brain in a way that you can't pick your own brain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I said I—I uh, I actually, when we first started doing this, as as you know, I was hesitant to. I had some imposter syndrome when we t when we started talking about joining the podcast, and I, I wasn't quite ready to do it. And then I realized that I do know the th the thing I know the things I know, and I can confidently talk about them. And early on, I tried to prepare, and now I kind of go off the cuff and just let let my knowledge bank speak for itself as, as we have discussions versus because just a Q and a with this, you know, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer is boring. Oh yeah. It's not. Um, so in, in our podcast, I don't really like to say that we interview people because that does sound more like a Q and a, mm -hmm. you know, it is more of a discussion in the film festival itself. It's called a Q and a, but the way that I hold the Q and A's, it's sort of like this, except for like, you know, 13 to 16 people. And yeah. we all have a part and, you know, we're not talking over each other or anything like that. We take turns and answer pretty much the same questions in a conversational way, which makes it really interesting and a really valuable part of the film festival. I feel like I'm trying to sell the film festival here today, Jason. <laughs> well, you should be. <laughs> The, the film festival is great, and uh, and people should be making films and submitting to it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, so yes. So now, again, one of the things that's really important is that one, two, three. You know that mm -hmm. that that is very important. Making movies with your phone is great. You can also make videos with your movie mm -hmm. with your <laughs> with your movie look with at, your phone. I, look at I I. Um, we just shot a short for Julian uh, for a contest he entered. But let's say Julian's full name because, you know, uh, we want to let everyone know who Julian is. He was also, he did an incredibly awesome episode here in our podcast mm -hmm. about audio. Yeah. And so Julian. Uh, Beat Bridget. Yes. And so I, I want to. Give people. I can't remember now the number, the episode that it is. I just looked at it, but I can't remember either. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> we'll we'll add a link to it because I think yeah. audio is also a hugely important part of oh, your absolutely of your production. But uh, going back to that, what were you saying? You were because you shot uh, you shot Julian. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, a couple of, yeah shot Julian a couple weekends ago. He entered a, a, a ten day mockumentary challenge. Um, and we, we threw everything at it. You know, the bulk of it's shot on mobile. Uh, there's a little bit of GoPro, and there's some a higher end DSLR for, for talking head interviews. Um, but yeah, we, there, there's, if we hadn't used mobile devices, we never would have shot as fast as we did we, with, with, the, with the time constraints. You, but you used, um, what, was the, uh, what, was the, what was the filming about? Um, there was a, it was a mockumentary of, um, what was the subject? Um, uh, two brothers are doing a docu, they're like, they're doing a documentary about, uh, the small town and people disappearing there and whatnot. Um, 
Yeah. So that was kind of the, the premise, and then, then 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 the two brothers you know get disappeared. Um. And yeah, so you know they, they, we literally used every tool we had, and basically you know being able to put a cell phone you know, suction cup to the windshield mm-hmm. uh, to get a lot of driving footage was, was super, super convenient. But as you're saying for video, all my, all my model making videos, um, which I make, because they're my marketing tool for the, the model building side of things. Um, it's all done. It's all shot on Filmic Pro on my, on my iPhones because I keep all my old ones. And I edit on Luma, Luma Fusion on my iPad. Nice. And, uh, and you were yeah. using Filmic Remote, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, we're gonna, yeah. Let's shift gears a little bit to tools because um, this is actually an important one. Um, so, I will say, say this: it's irritating to me, and I don't. Maybe it's a connection issue that they don't just work on Bluetooth. You need a Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, we had a conversation your, about how cool yeah, it would be Bluetooth. To yeah, so we had to use three devices to make this work: one phone to act as a Wi-Fi hot, hotspot the phone mounted on the windshield as the camera and then the iPad connected to the phone through filmic remote so as as they were in the car Julian was able to control the camera from the iPad in his lap <laughs> and it gives you full con- it, 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 and it gives you full control so you can do all the functions remotely it is it is a wonderful tool it's just having to have a third device as as a Wi-Fi hotspot, yeah. is 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 problematic, but I will say this: it's gotten it's gotten much more stable because this is probably the third time we've used it, and it didn't crash. Usually, it would crash like at least once in a in a shooting day, which is a ridiculously low failure rate. Let me be clear on that. But when we shot it, we used it all day, and hundred percent every time. Yeah, that that was good news when you told me that. And, you know, yeah. there was that one day, right, where we were supposed to actually record an episode, guys, and the internet broke down in Canada. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so we, so unlike the U.S., we have, like, three providers for, like, cell and internet and whatnot. There's, there's a few little ones, but it's, it's all monopolized. Yeah. And, and one of the three went down, so it took out, like, eight million people. That's so horrible. No, no, so anyone who so anyone who was with Rogers lost cell phone, internet and TV, but because most of the point of sale machines like debit mm. run through Rogers, oh, so debit no. so so debit was virtually out of commission completely across the country. <gasps> so what what oh gosh. Yeah, I didn't realize the, that part. Oh yeah, no, it was crazy. It, it it took like a day for them to get things back up. It was, it was wild. That's a lot of. I mean, that's everything. You know, servicing even um, hospitals. You yep. know, and uh, yeah, like we're, we're, like here, my wife and I are lucky because our cell phones are with a different provider. Good. Yeah, it's not so, good to have all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, exactly. So we were able to still, you know, we could still communicate and and, and whatnot. But yeah, that. Uh, yeah, what was that like a month ago? I think a month, month, month and a half ago, maybe. But yeah, I yeah, remember so, uh, that, and it was just like such a horrible news. We're not talking about just Twitter going out for people, you know, like when Twitter mm-hmm. has a blackout time, you know, yeah. or um, I don't even know if that's the right term, but like, they go like, out well, of business like, basically for a day. <laughs> yeah, like well, like like this, do it, I mean, the best way I can I can I can describe this. Imagine if a third of the U.S. lost all internet and cell phone capability. That's literally what happened here. Oh, we would have a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's like a little a little aside to tech and, and, and using, you know, using your phones and just how versatile they are now. I actually, oh, hey, I tried the Beast Cam today, finally. Oh, that has a really good reputation. What did you, what happened? Um, I was quite happy with it. Um, the interface is, the interface is pretty clean. I still think Filmic Pro has a more intuitive interface. Oh, wait, you're talking about their camera app? Yes. Oh, I thought you were talking about the actual hardware. Oh, yeah, no, I, no, I, I, I mean, I use that to hold the cameras in, in the car right. and, just, and just do handheld stuff. I did buy an Osmo Mobile 5, but I haven't used it yet. Hmm. Um, but, um, yeah, I tried, uh, tried the Beast Cam today, 
And um, like I said, the layout makes sense. It's just filmic is just a much easier, much easier to use, especially with your thumbs. Well, look, I mean, filmic pro has been around since the get go. Yeah. You know, uh, I go back to the beginning of after I launched the film festival in 2009 and, Mm -hmm. you know, being in that pioneer world, um, that's where filmic pro is. You know, they're pioneers yeah. in this. There, there really oh, yeah. were not uh, video camera apps before like this, you know, like Filmic Pro. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've, they've got a great team and they're constantly working on making it the best. It's, it's one of the reasons why the, you know, you know, people like Steven Soderbergh, you know, use them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? So um, I, it's uh, hard yeah, for yeah, me so, to yeah, compare they, that, but that doesn't mean that things are getting so good that another company can come in and compete with them. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, the, the Beast Cam, it's very clean. It, like, it's a very clean interface. It's just, I really like the, I just like the, the, like, the ability to, you know, to hold, you know, essentially, you know, you hold your camera in the Beast cage yeah. or whatever, or whatever cage you have, and you can just control your focus and, Focus and zoom on one side with your thumb, and the other side you can focus ISO and shutter speed. It's just, it's just nice, like it's it's just, it's, a, it's a much more comfortable ergonomic setup. But is it simpler as far as an interface, a user interface? Because you know, again, like if you're using a phone and you want to control every little detail, you might mm-hmm. as well just get a camera. I mean, another a, I would, you know. Here, my initial assessment, and I'd have to do more testing to to tell you for sure. I would say if you're doing handheld and you're on the fly, Filmic Pro is still the better better one to go with because it's just it's just so slick to use because you can cause you can just kind of move things quickly with your thumbs without having to having to go having to look through you know little not even menus just little tabs. Yeah. Um, but I would say that I'm I'm going to give Beast beast cam a bit more uh testing on my model making videos and see how i like it anyway there's that's, another that's one one more sorry uh pro cam yep. have you ever heard them hold on i might actually have and just haven't used it i've yet. had them for years uh, and they they also work for uh photos okay uh no i don't so hm. they're pretty good for photos too um you know, I've used them uh, for photographs, and I used them a long time ago for filming as well, you know. Um, and they give you a lot of features as well. But I still think that Filmic Pro is the, um, it just has mm-hmm. so much versatility to it. Yeah. And like I said, the, you, once again, you can't, beat, you can't beat the remote app because it's not doesn't just act as a remote. You can use it as a external monitor. Yeah, and see that's important. Mm-hmm. You know, which is which is great. Cause, I mean, me with my eyes, with my aged eyes, um, <laughs> a bigger a bigger screen is better. Um, anyway, I didn't mean to sidetrack it so much. Um, I think but basically, I think our when, listeners are enjoying this anyway. So yeah, I mean, but basically we we kind of covered covered the important things like before you before you can structure it, you really need to know who your characters are, what they want, why they want it, flaw to overcome, a false belief, and your story needs a theme. And the theme, I look, I had a lot of trouble with theme when I was in, like, growing up when I was in school. Like, we'd, we'd do book reports, like, what's the theme? I'm like, you haven't explained what the theme is. I can't answer the question. <laughs> um, but fundamentally, it's just a question you're trying to have answered or a message you're trying to get across. Yeah, and you would think that the theme, right, would be like Mm -hmm. the world that we're experiencing, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's uh, not that, right? I do. I do have an interesting thing on theme, though. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been kind of thinking about this a lot because in Blake Snyder Save the Cat, he's like, I've got this beat, you know, the, the theme stated beat. It happens in the first act, you know, when it's said to the main character by a secondary character. Because it's very important, you need to say it in some way. But I was watching Star Trek: The Motion Picture because they just remastered it, oh. and it's on Paramount Plus until the end of the month. 
for some reason. I don't know why it's not on there permanently. That's weird. Anyway, they wrap up the theme at the end of the movie. Like, like, like an episode of TV. They, you know, they have their they have their little discussion about the events that happened, and you know, they kind of wrap up the theme in in, in that way. And they did it. I believe they didn't. I know they didn't do it in Star Trek Two. Wonder Woman kind of did it. Early in Act One, they kind of a thing where you know it's like they uh, review a little can, bit. Yeah, like it, it's it's weird because in the opening, you know, in, in they're like in the in the first act, like you can do when you see something terrible in the world happening, you can do something or you can do nothing. That's kind of the the two people say variations of that in in the first act, but then at the end when she's talking to Ares, she talks about you know you can choose hate or love and I choose love, so it's kind of. You don't have to have just one theme in your movie. You should have one central theme you want to you want to explore, but you can throw in other thematic elements and just make a richer story. They just wouldn't get as much coverage as as the primary theme you're trying to cover. But you can you can absolutely wrap up your theme at the end of the movie if it if it fits. And now that theme comes in strong within a connection to the plot, right? I mean to the plot yeah. to the climax. Yeah, exactly. Be, be, because you spent the whole movie exploring, exploring theme and belief and and whatnot, and it all has to come to a head, and your character has to make a decision about what they're going to do. You know, are they going to, you know, choose path A and you know end up the same as they were before, or are they going to, you know, have a revelation about themselves through everything they've experienced from the beginning of Act One to the climax. And that's and why a character too. development is so important. Now, I wanted to touch on that for a minute, on the human factor of storytelling, because that's really important into my message to the world of all of you <laughs> and all of us, and that is how we connect. We connect through our stories, but we mm-hmm. do that as humans. Because like when they get to the end, like you were saying, you know, just answering these questions, you know, from the journey, each different character will have a different way of approaching that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah, when you were saying about that, I was thinking about, you know, anthrop- an- you know anthropomorphizing and, you know, sympathizing with characters who, who aren't human. And uh, I mean, look, at we've seen it. We've seen it all through film history, but in, in recent history, you know, the, the droids from, from Star Wars. R2-D2 is not human, but you love that character. Right. Um, or when whatever the, whatever the robot is in, in Rogue One, the, uh, you know, when it gets killed, you're like, oh, I cared about, oh, I did care about that character who wasn't a real person. Like, a flesh and blood person, I guess. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, and again, it's just I mean I'm trying to emphasize that that it doesn't have to be a human, but it has to be, have the human factor. Yeah, you exactly. Know, to the story, and and I don't mean like well, that I mean, object, but, but it's from the perception of the protagonist of the human. Well, well, exactly because look, if you can, it's the challenge of writing and making people empath. People will care once they can empathize with your character. So you need to you need to put all that in. And you can make people care about about a character that isn't a human being. Yes. And it, it, it can be challenging, but it's it's absolutely doable because we've seen it time and time again. I mean, remember when all the kids cried at the end of E. T. or the middle of E. T. or or whatnot. I mean yeah. here's a little alien. Oh I you know oh I do care about that little alien and I do care about that that robot and I do care about this and that yeah it's uh yeah it, it's i think that's one of the yeah. most powerful things that video and film do and mm-hmm. storytelling is um bring empathy into the world in a way that you didn't know you had it yep well that's that's the thing it's it's <laughs> it's uh using storytelling to how do i want to say it Look, sometimes you can be a bit subversive. It's like, oh, 
that movie about robots is not really about robots. Yeah. The, the robots are allegory for for people or, you know, minorities or, you know, animals in distress or whatever, whatever your thing is. That's that's the whole thing about 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 movie making and, and script writing is that sometimes you can't approach the problem directly, but you can trick people into into seeing what you're really trying to sell. Yeah, and it's not a bad trick. It's not a negative. Trick. Yeah, no, no. Well, it's a whole thing. It's yeah. like you know, it's a whole the, the whole story of Star Trek is that Gene Roddenberry couldn't tell stories about war and racism on TV in the '60s, but he could tell stories about space war and space racism yeah as allegories for things people are experiencing in present day this is storytelling is a it's a super powerful tool and um i highly recommend people people learn it and love it and do it and people already do they just they just don't focus on it um and use it um in the way that other people who know about it do um, yeah, exactly. You know. and, here, and, and here's the thing I'm going to say. This is, this, is, this is where I'm going to take a bit, bit of a hard line on, on writing. Your first film, if you haven't learned how to tell, tell a story, that's fine. Because... You're learning. It, 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 yeah, it's, it's an evolutionary process. But at some point, a choice is made to not learn how to tell a proper story. And that, that's unacceptable. Now, much like filmmaking... You don't have to learn how to tell a story, but you should find someone who does, who can assist you. Just like, you know, a film, you know, someone may be a great director, but they can't direct and shoot their film at the same time. You need to bring in someone who's specialized. It's the same thing with writing. If you are having trouble with it or can't learn it or don't have the time to learn it, find someone who does, who can join your team. You know, I worked in video production for many, many, many years. And Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that one of the executive producers said is, you know, we have, you know, people that we hire to produce and we have people that we hire as videographers and then we have our editors. We don't mind if the producer is the videographer, you know, Mm -hmm. but we don't want that person to also be the editor. Yeah. And I witnessed that um, really blatantly one time where this one guy kept saying uh, to the editor, no, 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 this, I want this shot. No, 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 I want that shot. Wait, what about, where's my shot that I took for this? And they were arguing. And it was like in my head, right, not to them, I was, you know, just starting out. And in my head, I went, this guy fell in love with all the shots he took because you do. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. why are you shooting them, right? And now he wants to see them all in this video. The video was a story with a message, and it has to flow. Let the editor do that. You do want to give the editor as much as possible. But the editor is the one, and that was... Something I learned from the get-go, which is very hard to do. Now, for me, um, I don't look, I don't like being in front of the camera. And so when Mm -hmm. I edit videos of our events, right, Mm -hmm. at first it was like, I don't want to be in it. I don't want to be in it. But (laughs) here's the thing. Too bad. Well, that's the (laughs) thing. I take off the hat and this comes with many years of editing videos you take off the hat of the shots you love and the footage that you love and you focus on what that story is that you want to share and the structure and then it's like damn it there's this one shot of me in here damn it i'm just gonna have to include it i don't tell everybody by the way don't look at that one (laughs) but that (laughs) is the way it is you know what i'm saying and i've been getting better and better at leaving stuff out that doesn't need to be there, you know? Mm-hmm, yep. And, oh, yeah, and making I'm, uh, <laughs> sure that I include the things, whether I like the shot or not, you know what I'm saying? Uh, if if that's all I have and it needs to be in there, it just needs to be in there. Now I just got to get creative with how I'm going to put that in there so 
it looks okay. No, I get it. I'm I'm actually a pretty brutal brutal editor. Like I'll cut 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 to uh, if it, it, if I just need to keep the story the story or in of course I do more video than than film. Right. Um. Um. But yeah, I got I got to keep things going because I've been doing doing a lot on TikTok. I'm like I got a minute, so I got to get this. You know, no dilly dally, and let's get this get the stuff out. That's the other thing too that you know that you just brought up between shooting videos and shooting films, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously they're both the same as far as what the format is, what you're shooting with, all that stuff. But the artistic value of a film, you know, is, 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 it's less of a video. (laughs) Um, And that's why it's a film. That right there, what you were just talking about, is really important because I watch a lot of films, you know, I have to because people Mm -hmm. are submitting and I'm watching all of them, just so you know, every single one of them beginning to end. And one of the things that I notice with some of them is that the artistic part of the filmmaker who is most likely also editing is in Mm -hmm. love with this one shot and romanticizes the reason why they're going to make it this way. Mm -hmm. And to me, looking at it from uh, my perspective, it's like, I know you love this, but this just killed your ability. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? To entertain people. Yeah. Yeah. No, you gotta be in, in this, in this whole process, you need to be willing to, willing to sacrifice things that you think are, are beautiful if they don't serve the story. And that goes for writing and shots. Yeah, it's really, really important. It's, it's really not, I mean, the easiest part is grabbing your phone and learning an app and grabbing some gear. That really is the, the, the easiest part because it's very technical, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. It's, it's like, oh, I learned how to play the piano. I know the keys and blah, blah, blah. The hard part, though, is to make your own songs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and to and and it's kind of the same thing with film. You know, you can have beautiful films, but if they're if they're not um, entertaining, if they're not captivating, I, I call them out like, you know, am I thinking about this movie after the credits have finished rolling? You know, and by the way, I'm just going to rant for a second. <laughs> I think Netflix, Never. I think ne- Netflix need to show a little more respect to the filmmaking industry by not shutting off the credits <laughs> right as they really start rolling. <laughs> you think Netflix bad? Watch Tubi. <laughs> you got four seconds. You got four seconds before the next movie starts playing. It's awful. <laughs> well. Uh, I just, I don't like that. I think that's an important, that's part of the movie. And I hate well, that. Well, that's why I, I, I like what Marvel's doing with um, the uh, the interesting end credits. Like the the Spider-Man movies. Oh, well, yeah. Well, they'll, okay, yeah, so, so they, they leave that part. in Netflix, if you have mm-hmm. things like that, they'll leave it. But mm-hmm. then as soon as that's over, boom, you're done. But yeah. I, I just really want people to, these these you know, the streaming networks, whatever you want to call them, I want them to yeah. make sure that they leave the credits. Uh, you know, that that's super important. I just think it's mm-hmm. disrespectful. Netflix, come on, guys. <laughs> Let people choose mm-hmm. to get rid of that. Like maybe even have a setting, you know? Yeah, but yeah, exactly. I would like Netflix to not play trailers while I'm browsing. Oh yeah, there is. I a, hate that. Like, there, I, I'm trying. I just, I just want to read the blurb. I don't want you to start playing video. See, and some of them don't even have a trailer. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, and so then just you're play, like, just play a clip. Like nothing. They have nothing. Uh, they're just there, and I'm like, oh, well, I want to see that one. <laughs> and <laughs> and that's yeah. up to whoever is is doing that. Maybe it's the filmmaker. I'm not sure. I don't have a movie in there, so I don't know. Um, all right. Uh, well, how can we end this, Jason? Uh, for our <laughs> listeners, let's let's wrap up yeah, the we, candy. Yeah, yeah, we went a little uh, went a little off book there, but I mean, it was it was 
just a little bit of catch up and just focusing on the things that are important. But really, review once again, just for kind of like the, the third time. When ideally developing your story, consider the elements you need that are going to guide your character and plot. And you need these to apply structure. You need to know either what does your character want and what do they need? Are they the same things? Are they not? If that doesn't fit, what flaw do they have that needs to be overcome? Two, you need your character to have a false belief about themselves or the world. And because that's the thing that has guided all their decision-making up to this point in their life. Because you need to show what their life is like before the journey starts. So why do they make bad decisions? You know, there's something they, they believe that's wrong. And then three, what is the central theme of your story? What, what topic do you want to explore? Or what question do you want to have answered through, through the course of the movie? You pin these things down, everything else will flow much easier afterwards, and then you can structure your story, which we are going to start talking about next. We're going to go through each beat, where they go, why they go, so you can understand how to properly structure your story. And Jason is going to sing, too. <laughs> yeah, that's what you, you think so, eh? <laughs> All right, Jason. Thanks for coming on again. It's nice to have you yes. back. Yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get we'll get this this thing rolling again after after a little break there and uh, help uh, help all those wonderful filmmak all those wonderful filmmakers out there. I'm sorry, it's getting late. Um, to uh, <laughs> to to step up to to take their mo- take their movies from good to great. Awesome. It's always it's always uh, a great great having. It's always great having a conversation with you and being able to share it with our listeners. Speaking of, say goodbye to everybody, Jason. Goodbye, everyone, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have said this at the beginning. I apologize to everyone if there's a little bit of a hum. It's a million degrees here. I can't not run a fan during this conversation. <laughs> I'm suffering over here. <laughs> I've got no fan on. <laughs> oh, you fool. I know, right? Well, you know, where I am right now, it's okay. All right. Good. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.